Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapursky. I'm the CEO of Avo Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And I'm joined today by Jonathan. Jonathan, can you please introduce yourself and share a little bit about what you do? Hi, good morning, Dr. Gleb. I'm Jonathan Treble. I'm the founder and CEO of With Me Inc. With Me provides convenient technology powered amenities to real estate operators nationwide. Mm -hmm. And we have a remote workforce of 75 teammates, uh, not only throughout the US, but in five different countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm a big fan of your work and I'm excited to talk to you about leading remote organizations today. Excellent. Happy to talk about it. It's interesting that you lead a remote organization while you provide services for real estate professionals. But uh, tell me a little bit about why you made the choice to go with being remote. And you weren't always fully remote. So how did that choice even happen in the first place? Right. Like many companies during COVID, as soon as everyone went into lockdown, we went mm -hmm. from our office in Chicago to having everybody work from home. Most of the team at that time, and we were a lot smaller back then in 2020, mm -hmm. most of the team was based in the Chicago area and mm -hmm. had been commuting into the office. But then once we adapted to the remote style of work with online communications, we we embraced Slack. We were more intentional about our meeting structure and cadences. Mm -hmm. We realized that it was a big, uh, a big unlock for us. And mm. what we found, even though those were emotionally trying times with the pandemic and health concerns, a lot of folks were were actually happy to focus on their work and and mm -hmm. working well, and realizing that they had more time in their day because they didn't have to commute up to an hour or more into the office in Chicago. And slowly, uh, people on that team started moving outside of Chicago, and myself oh. included. We had three relocations within a few months. And uh, from that point on, we realized, you know, we don't need to be a Chicago-based company. And and sure, mm. we still headquartered there. We have our main facility there, and we have a, we have a crew that goes into that warehouse every day, but that's a small percentage of our total workforce now. Uh, since 2020, in those in the four years since the pandemic, we have added 50 teammates in a combined 21 states in additional <laughs> in addition to Illinois. And yeah, like many companies, we just realize remote is very mm -hmm. efficient. Uh, it's it's very very ad uh, very uh desirable for mm -hmm. for uh knowledge workers and yeah we're we're happy to to be a remote first organization so it sounds like for you remote was mainly is mainly driven wasn't is by employee satisfaction am i hearing that correctly tell me a little bit more about how you evaluated that employee satisfaction versus a lot of other factors that companies are considering that are making the decision to return to office. So you've seen other companies return to office in a hybrid or some even fully office-centric modality, and you've clearly chosen not to do that. So what is different about with me in that regard? You know, that's a great question, Dr. Gleb. And what works for us may not work for every company. And I, mm -hmm. I don't want to say I have a silver bullet that every company should follow. What I realized for our company is that we we became very efficient at working remotely mm -hmm. and yes it was it, it maintained its appeal for all workers even after the pandemic had subsided and people could have gone back to offices back in 21 or 22 when they had the vaccine cards and so forth our team at the time and at, by that point we were about 40 people they were really enjoying the remote style mm -hmm. and want to you know pull the rug out from under them and say hey mm. we all have to move back to chicago and, and so to a certain extent uh the decision was made during covid to start hiring people out of state of illinois mm -hmm. and at that point the cat is already out of the bag right you, it's really mm. hard to go back from there mm. nevertheless i firmly believe it's better for our company to be fully remote and the main mm. reason 
is talent acquisition. Okay. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a big, if there's one thing that I really ner nerd out over these days in, in operating my company, it's recruiting and talent acquisition mm -hmm. and hiring the best possible people for roles. Mm -hmm. I have found in, and I can give you several examples, um, but we don't have that much time today, but I have found I've been able to hire a plus employees for very specific roles as we've mm -hmm. scaled the company from different corners of the United States, even mm -hmm. secondary or tertiary labor markets mm -hmm. where you would never expect to find an amazing marketing specialist in, mm -hmm. in some of these markets, but they live there and they have for different personal reasons and they love working remote and they want to find a remote company. And to me, the the talent benefits of that make so much sense. And I'll, I'll just mm -hmm. summarize this in a simple math expression, right? The Chicago, the greater Chicago population, where we were headquartered, equates to about 2.8% of the US population today. And that's some miles radius around Chicago. So commutable into downtown Chicago. 2.8% of the labor market, by extension, is a very small amount of the labor market, right? If you're looking for niche roles, sure, sure. You, can find, you can find people that have experiences that you're looking for, but they're going to be fewer than being mm -hmm. able to post to the whole country and receive resumes that, you know, might be 33 as times as many, right? Your, your labor pool grows significantly by more than an order of magnitude. And to your point, employee satisfaction is higher with remote. There, there are there's more demand for remote jobs mm -hmm. today than there are than there is a supply of those remote jobs. Right. So we're getting excess applicants than what the market should offer. And to me, it just makes so much sense, right? I can get better talent mm -hmm. from different parts of the US. There's also slightly a cost benefit to that because if you're in a tertiary market, your cost of living isn't as high. The prevailing salary rates aren't as high as downtown Chicago, um, though that's not that's not the main driving factor. That is a, a nice benefit. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it, I mean, math shows the, the benefits of working remote. Now, again, it's not for every company with me, Inc. We have we have a lot of knowledge workers and we have a lot of salespeople that need to be in different territories throughout the United States. So it makes sense for us to be remote, I think, mm -hmm. in almost every case. Uh, but I know that doesn't always make sense for every company. Let me go back to something you said earlier in your comments, and I understand the recruitment, huge benefits, satisfaction, huge benefits, but you said you figured out how to make remote work efficient. And I think that's what a lot of companies stumble over, how to make remote work efficient. So let's unpack that. What does it make or what does it take to make remote work efficient? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we were all learning this during COVID, right? And we all mm. experimented with different chat systems, whether you're on mm -hmm. Slack or Teams or something else. And we learned quickly what, what works well and what doesn't. And mm -hmm. uh, to, to us, you know, we had to set up our Slack instance very thoughtfully. We have mm -hmm. the right channel groups for team, for mm -hmm. different teams out there. We have leadership groups. We have... Uh, hybrid groups across two teams that interact a lot together so that they can mm. both share messages. I mean, these are now like basic building blocks for a remote mm. company, but they they weren't exactly clear at the time. And yeah. like most companies, we had to figure that out. We became more efficient at it. And we've even come up with many iterations now of our communications guidelines. Mm. What, what kind of response time do we expect, right? And that's because we don't, necessarily want people glued to their chat system throughout the day, right? So mm -hmm. Slack or Teams, that can be a distracting source of, of notifications. Uh, I've experienced the burnout of that myself. So we've set up some guidelines that say, hey, we're not going to expect you to always be on there, but you should check every maybe a few times a day and just make sure that mm -hmm. people aren't waiting for an important response or an urgent response. Mm -hmm. We've set different service levels of response by channel. So if somebody really needs mm. to get a hold of somebody else, they can call or text them. And we expect somebody to be able to answer that very quickly. Slack, mm -hmm. we expect within a couple of hours. And then email, the, the least urgent channel, we expect a turnaround time of that within about 24 hours. 
Um, mm-hmm. so we we want to be mindful of the employee experience here. Uh, burnout is is a real potential with remote work because sure. of the the difficulty to separate work and home and and have you know on hours and off hours. So we want to be careful, and I think over time we've learned to be efficient at that. Hmm. One of the biggest challenges, you haven't talked about this, so you talked about communication, collaboration, which is definitely a big challenge. Uh, you haven't talked about, I'm curious, what you do about onboarding new staff. Because yeah. when I work with companies, I mean, I've worked with over two dozen companies to figure out their hybrid work models. And this tends to be the one of the biggest challenges. And you grew quickly. So you had to somehow figure out how to onboard new staff, how to figure out those dynamics. And those are challenging dynamics if you've never seen each other in person. And, and if you haven't built up those relationships, you haven't learned from following people around. So tell me what you do about onboarding and mentoring new staff, not only in the first 30 days, but in the first several years. Okay, great question. Yeah, onboarding is tricky. We all remember most of us, right, starting careers in offices Mm -hmm. before the pandemic. And and there's a certain special uh, vibe, I guess you could say, about onboarding in an office where you can bump into people left and right and introduce and and so it's it's difficult to do that in a virtual setting or i shouldn't say difficult you just have to be very thoughtful and intentional mm-hmm. what we've done is we've set the first 2 weeks for any role to be very regimented with onboarding sessions some of those mm-hmm. are led by hr to get the basic onboarding things out of the way and then most of those those sessions are actually set by department so whether that's the head of the department training one of their direct reports in an intensive way, or it's a more you know junior employee that is on a team and needs to learn how to do the functions of their job, those two weeks are going to be very regimented and mm-hmm. have a lot of one-on-one meetings or group meetings if there's a group of new employees starting. Um, and I've even often joined in that first two weeks and uh, Mm -hmm. done a CEO introduction to try to set a cultural tone for for joining the company. That's important for the the first two weeks. And then, as you said, we need to maintain that in an ongoing way. Mentorship is uh, is something that we still need to build out more. We don't have a Mm -hmm. formal mentor program internally. Uh, What I can say is we're very thoughtful about one-on-one meetings between supervisors and reports, we require them weekly. Uh, and we have even some questions that we we ask supervisors to always ask of their reports, mm. no matter what the no matter what level of the company, you know, how satisfied are you with your job? Mm. How could I be a better manager to you? What would you change if you could about the company or your position? Um, so we're we're very thoughtful about that because we know we need to ask and solicit this feedback in a remote setting more than we would if we were running into this person every day in an office. Yeah, uh, so it sounds like you got the onboarding part figured out and you're working on the mentoring. It reminds me of what uh, is happening with Atlassian, which is a company that's very well known for mm-hmm. having a remote first culture, but I'm working with them as a consultant to help them specifically figure out their mentoring because they find that their onboarding is good. But Mm -hmm. what happens with new grads in the first two, three, four years, that's been a challenge, though that that period is a difficulty. So thinking about mentoring, what I find works well with other companies with Atlassian is setting up a mentor, two mentors, one from your own team, Mm -hmm. from the person's own team who is not the supervisor but the, someone who is a peer. So having a peer-to-peer relationship to help that new hire who's been after the first two weeks to get them all into the team culture and dynamics and the relationships because those are difficult for the manager to convey. It's much easier for a co- for someone who's a peer to convey that mentoring. That's one. And then a mentor from outside your team who can help you connect across the organization and build those valuable relationships, those what are called weak ties, which really help develop people's careers, help facilitate innovation. And so those are two one-on-one relationships. And finally, having a peer cohort, having several junior grads together who 
are mentored by one senior person, again, peer-to-peer -peer relationship, and they can do mutual mentoring of each other, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, as well as getting mentoring from that senior person, senior person. So thinking about that dynamic might be helpful for you as you're building out your own mentoring program. That sounds very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Now, thinking about the future of remote work at uh, with me, what are you thinking about working on next? What do you plan to improve? What do you plan to focus on? How does it look like in the next couple of years? It's a great question. We are currently, as, as I mentioned earlier, at 75 teammates. And right now I feel like we have a, a good set of communication mm -hmm. guidelines and cadences. Uh, both for peer-to-peer -peer communication, but also top-down messaging. But I think we need to continually improve that and evolve it as we mm -hmm. scale to 100 teammates and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a saying in startup world or scale-up world that everything breaks when you get three times as much uh, revenue. <laughs> Not necessarily teammates, but revenue. And for a company that's nearly doubled every year, you know that mm -hmm. means we could be things are kind of breaking and needing to be rebuilt every 18 months mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're noticing that in some systems and and we're ha doing a great job rebuilding a lot of our operational systems but culture and hr and people management is, is mm -hmm. also something that needs to be continually improved so i think it's going to come down to communication it's mm -hmm. Uh, top-down communication, peer-to-peer -peer communication, cross-department communication, getting getting really intentional about that, um, doing it with a thoughtful balance to not over-communicate but not under-communicate. Uh, there could definitely be too much of either one, right? Uh, so it's it really comes down to communication, I believe. Uh, it's going to mm -hmm. be about iterating that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, Jonathan. That was very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Gleb. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show.